started this conversation about how we would conduct this conversation, uh, one of the questions I have is what do I bring to the table? I'm, I'm sitting, I live in, in northern Indiana. I, uh, I live in a very small community. There's Amish buggies that go through my yard. You know, I, this, this morning, though, if I illustrate this, I left my house. My father-in-law, who's 85, was uh, sleeping in the guest bedroom. He's been at our house for 13 days. It's a product of a severely dysfunctional uh, moment in time between he and his wife. Uh, as we try to navigate that real hard thing, um, it hits me that, that one of the, the things that Susie and I are lacking, we're hurting for, is what's the real story here with his wife? Do we know exactly? Is, is there, in fact, is there some mental stuff? Is it dementia? Is there Alzheimer's? Is there histrionic personality disorder? Is there psychopathy? You know, I mean, what is, is there anything like that? Because if we don't get that right, all of our solutions seem like they're going to be messed up. And so part of what I've wanted to do, what I've restrained myself from doing in this, in this moment is, is to move into this conversation, trying my best to understand the problem in ways that um, maybe at least give all of us a pause. And so I went to a source that's a, that's a bit of a different source. I went to Jacques Ellul, who wrote a book published in 1974 called The Meaning of the City. Now, if you think about, think of Dallas Willard or C.S. Lewis and folks that are sort of brilliant in, as professors in a particular way and then took their brilliance and applied it to the wider questions of Christendom through the lens of Scripture. So Elul was a, uh, um, a French sociologist and law professor. And as a brilliant sociologist committed to Scripture, he began to see issues of sociology, issues that sociologists would look at through the lens of Scripture and began to raise questions and actually offer commentary that I think is still fascinating. I'd like to offer that into our equation here today. This first segment, I'm going to depress you with what I offer. Because, frankly, the book depressed me, and I feel like it's okay to pass on pain like that. <laughs> he made the point that the impulse of a city is rooted in its spiritual heritage, that he says there is a, a seductive power inbred in the city that goes all the way back to its very beginnings, that Cain's impulse to build a city was to carve out a life that was apart from God. So estranged from God, now I'm going to get my security on my own. I'm going to build my own. And, and this whole section of his book is devoted to this notion of builders. And he unpacks not just Cain, but Nimrod, the city, the, the degeneration of, of, uh, of Israel's kings, Rehoboam's uh, building his own strength in his own way, in his own city environment. And he digs a little di deeper, the abbess, and, and he comes to the conclusion that the city is not itself sort of neutral territory. There is a spiritual force and presence there that sucks the life out of people. Now, raise your hand if you've had the city suck the life out of you recently. I mean, maybe that's fair, but, it, but it's fascinating that he's, he's doing this as a commentator on all things that are sociologically sort of messed up here. All of us who are inclined to work towards city ministry would do well to slow our solution-finding impulses. That's where my contribution might be at the beginning here. Slow our solution-finding impulses so that we can at least think about what Elul has to say. Is there more at work here than we have reckoned with? And could it be that that's one of the reasons it's so hard for us to do good work in the city? We do good work in pockets. We have victory moments. But could it be? The builder impulse within us is our independent streak. And it, uh, it's, it's captured in sin's first response to defend ourselves, to ensure our own security and our own future, rather than surrender ourselves humbly to God. 
So my true confession is that it's not hard for me to recognize this builder impulse within me. It's not hard for me to look back on my career, on my investment in organizations and some of the things that I've actually started and built up and how I'm attached to those things and how I now find my security in those things. And, and I, I look at that and go, wow, it's, that's very different. The, the notion of building feels like a different impulse than the impulse to follow Jesus. Does that make sense? It's certainly the place that I've gone. So I, so I can you know, ask the question, well, what of the church of the city? What about God's people in the midst of a city where we've, you know, it's been built? It's been built. The story is there. So, well, here in the Minneapolis-St. Paul, we know that practicing Christians are much more highly educated than in most cities. That's just sort of a data fact. Unfortunately, the National Study of Youth and Religion shows us a correlation there that, that is chalks that up as perhaps an unintended uh, deficit, not necessarily an asset. It's correlated with low commitment to God by teenagers. We also know that there's a you know, higher degree of income by Christians in this area. That too on five religiosity measures doesn't show up good. So just because we've got some things going good here doesn't mean it predicts automatically here. There's an unprecedented level of energy and funding for youth programs everywhere. It's one of the conclusions of Christian Smith and those who did that massive study. Unfortunately, youth feel systematically abandoned by adults, and they end up constructing their own netherworld web of support. That's the conclusion of Chap Clark in his research, Hurt and Hurt 2.0. This is a scary thought. Here we are mobilized, throwing programs, doing our best work ever, lots of money, lots of resources, and the conclusion of some of the best research that we have to work with is it's not working. It's not doing well. We know that youth ministry practices are widely program-centered. And the notion there is, if you show up, we can help you. Here in the metro area, there's about 23,000 teenagers between 12 and 17 years old who live at less than 50% of the poverty level. 23,000. And in that environment, it's not easy for you to show up somewhere. And the crises are chronic, and helping relationships are rare. There is an indicting quote I'd like to take a little bit of time to read for you because, frankly, a lull says it in a way that uh, I couldn't. So thus the life of the city is dominated by a curse, not only because of its human origins, but because of its spiritual presence. Dealing with the urban problem are sociologists and lawmakers, urban specialists and politicians, architects and economists, humanists and revolutionaries, and they are all looking for a moral solution, a legal solution to the multitude of inhuman problems brought up by the city. Clearly, solutions are called for. And while the search is going on, the vampire does its work and calls for more flesh, fresh blood. And new throngs of men take up residence under the rule of the curse. They work, they live the city's unchanging, inhuman life, now irretrievably their life, with no way out but the cemetery. Others try to find solutions far from those who are suffering, and their solutions are impossible for the sufferers. And the bright star, the wormwood star, continues his work imperturbably, getting just as much use out of the urbanist's wide avenues, the children's parks, paid vacations, workers' apartments, public transportation, and disposal systems as out of slums and tuberculosis. Ramps up the game. What is the diagnosis? What's really going on? If we believe it's just a, an urban solution, then let's put our best minds to work and just go at it. 
if there's something deeper involved, something spiritual involved, something significant in that regard, then we have a different course of action that we're going to be propelled to take. All of us who live in the cities are faced with our responsibilities. Subject to the city, involved in its condemnation, it's cursed by the Lord. And yet, still, in this moment, artisans of her adoption by God. As we move through our segments here, we're going to move towards solutions. And I'm going to revisit Elul. He didn't end up such a downer. But having said that, the challenge is to take seriously the possibility that what we're up against is not flesh and blood. And it explains an awful lot of the crises that we can't seem to get a handle on here in the city. 